thank you all for coming to our tutorial today uh, in such great numbers. It is truly an honor. We hope uh, that uh, through the next uh, three hours or so, we will be able to uh, uh, guide you into this uh, new and exciting world uh, of uh, neural algorithmic reasoning. This is a tutorial that uh, we envisioned as being split into three parts. And the, fir the first part is titled Developing neural algorithmic reasoning. So we're going to talk about in this first part, I will try to tell you a little bit about how we can develop neural algorithmic reasoning solutions using the tools we have available to us right now. So let's dive into it. Uh, and first of all, let's dive into a bit of motivation. I feel like when we talk about neural algorithmic reasoning, it's good to start by hammering down what is it about, what are the key concepts, and why should we be doing it uh, the, way, uh, the, way, uh, the way that we're doing it right now. So uh, first of all, uh, we talk about algorithmic reasoning. And actually, in my previous talks, uh, I sort of assumed that the, that the audience uh, knows uh, what an algorithm is. But actually, having went back on it for the purpose of this tutorial, I realized that we don't really have a very clear and concise general definition of an algorithm. I went to this uh, Introduction to Algorithms textbook, which is one of the staple, uh, staple textbooks in the area, and I basically just copied a few passages from there. So how can we define an algorithm? Basically, informally, an algorithm can be seen as any well-defined computational procedure that takes some value or set of values and produces some value or set of values as output. And thus, an algorithm can be seen as a sequence of computational steps that transforms the input into the output. And then the authors go further to describe that an algorithm can be given in a variety of modalities, English language, computer program, or even a hardware design. The only requirement, whatever that means, is that the specification must give a precise description of the computational procedure to be followed. Now, this feels a little bit vague, and maybe it's deliberately vague to allow for all kinds of pseudocode ways to specify an algorithm, but I feel like it's good then, since we don't have a very concise definition, uh, to show a concrete example and then kind of align on what we expect an algorithm to look like. So an algorithmic uh, task is typically defined by specifying what the input and the output should satisfy. So one traditional problem that we'll look at at a few cases at a few moments today is the sorting task, where our input is a sequence of n numbers, a1 to an. And what we want as output is some permutation or reordering of those n numbers, a prime, uh, a1 prime, a2 prime, and so on, such that uh, the numbers are sorted, right? And this is the algorithmic task. And one possible algorithm that solves it is uh, the insertion sort algorithm, which uh, gradually goes through the elements of the sequence one at a time and keeps the sequence partially sorted up to that location. So at every step, it takes uh, the item at position J and uh, finds the right place for it uh, in the sequence from one to J minus one. And we can prove that if you do this uh, iteratively one step at a time, at the end, you will have a sorted sequence. Now, this is the general idea of an algorithm. We might then start to wonder why should we care about algorithms so much uh, as deep learning researchers? And uh, I will give a few maybe personal, maybe less personal, more motivated reasons for why we should think about algorithms collectively. Uh, I really like to think about algorithms because I see them as these essential pure forms of combinatorial reasoning because they're so vaguely specified and should work no matter what the underlying domain is. They're a principle that should remain no matter what the model of computation is. So whether you do your computation on a CPU, GPU, TPU, maybe in the future we'll, do, we'll all do quantum computation. It's quite certain that we'll be using algorithms to talk about computations in this space. And it allows us to talk about reasoning in a way that's fully decoupled from any form of perception. And algorithms also have many favorable properties that make them nice to work with. They often trivially strongly generalize. So if you run an algorithm and you, you build an algorithm while looking at inputs of size 100, that algorithm will still work in the same way when you run it on inputs of size 10,000. It might run a bit slower, but it will have the same properties. And uh, typically algorithms, because of their pseudocode specification, can be very nicely composed with each other, treat different parts of them as subroutines. You might be able, because of the abstract language, to, in some cases, prove that these algorithms will be correct and even guarantee how quickly they will terminate or how much memory they will consume. And also the pseudocode allows for interpretability. So basically, strong generalization, compositionality, interpretability, provable correctness, and guarantees 
these are all the things that neural networks tend to be really bad at, right? So if we're able to take some inspiration from algorithms to bring neural networks closer to them, we might end up reaping the rewards of both worlds and having more stronger uh, neural network models going forward. And maybe the last point, which uh, for me is quite personal, the way in which I got into computer science as a whole, not just machine learning, was through competitive programming algorithms and data structures. And basically for me, this whole area is a way to go full circle on my education kind of hits very close to home. And uh, based on my conversations with a lot of people in machine learning, there is a sizable number of us who have come into this whole field through uh, competitive programming. So I think there's also a nice uh, connection there too. However, for all the nice things that algorithms can do uh, that neural networks cannot, uh, algorithms also exhibit certain flaws that, uh, in my opinion, most theoretical computer scientists don't like to discuss as much, but maybe they should. So let's think a little bit about when do these classical algorithms tend to exhibit flaws. And to show you this example, I will ask you to kind of visualize in your mind the uh, seemingly very simple task. I'm going to ask you to find me the optimal path from A to B, no additional context. Now, if you are a theoretical computer scientist or a software engineer and you see a task like this, the chances are nine times out of 10, you will react to this in a very singular manner, which is you will diligently pull out your Dijkstra hammer and you will try to treat this as a so shortest path problem in a weighted graph where you have some source vertex and you have uh, edge weights telling you the distance between different nodes and you run your Dijkstra's algorithm or Bellman Ford algorithm and uh, it will give you the shortest path tree, which are the edges highlighted in red here. So this tells you what are the shortest ways to go from the source vertex to every other vertex in the graph. However, I didn't say anything about what the input looks like, and the theoretical computer scientist has made some subtle assumptions here on what the input looks like. In fact, in reality, when we want to answer a problem of finding optimal paths from A to B, very often there's a real world problem lurking underneath. So for example, I might be asking you to give me routing decisions in a real world uh, road network. And the real world state of the road network is something that's not quite graph structured and not quite structured with like one scalar per edge. So it's actually far more common that it's a very dynamically changing system with uh, roadblocks, traffic jams, traffic lights, weather conditions, all sorts of things that might influence the flow of traffic and it's all data that's raw and dynamically changing. And uh, what's then subtly assumed is that uh, somebody has to then do the mapping to make the Dijkstra's algorithm applicable in the first place. Somebody has to do the mapping from these natural raw inputs to the space of abstract inputs where the algorithm is even applicable. And uh, traditionally, this has always been done manually, either through manual uh, engineering or through writing of heuristics that consume the raw data and produce something where an algorithm can be executed. But can we actually ever hope as humans to manually do the mapping that is necessary in all possible scenarios? I like to think that since as early as the 1950s, it was already reasonably well known that the answer is no. Uh, and my favorite example, I highly recommend it uh, if you're interested in algorithms more generally, is this paper on uh, methods for evaluating rail network capacities, which was one of the first papers to introduce the famous max flow problem. Uh, so finding the optimal flow in a, in a flow network. And uh, the authors of this paper did it in the context of studying rail network capacities. And actually very early on in the paper, they have this very telling paragraph where they say that evaluating the railway system and what are the individual capacities of the railway network so that you can run the flow algorithm in the first place is actually to a considerable extent an art. The authors know of no tested mathematical model or formula that includes all of the imponderables. And even when someone has been like closely intimately associated with the territory and railway network they're evaluating, the final input that you get for the flow algorithm, no matter how accurate, is one of judgment and experience. So this in one paragraph summarizes the key problem that we have here, that while algorithms are a very nice computational model, they're somewhat disjoint from the real world and mapping the inputs of an algorithm so that you can actually run the algorithm on them is somewhat more of an art than a science. And this is a very specific divide between algorithms and the real world tasks that they were initially designed to solve. 
Specifically, if you want to morph your data so that you can satisfy the strict preconditions of an algorithm, it may lead to a drastic loss of information. Or put succinctly, it doesn't really matter that you can prove that the algorithm is correct if you run it on the inputs that are wrong, okay? So if you don't have enough data or you don't have the right heuristic to properly map your real world into an algorithmic input, it doesn't matter that you can run the algorithm, the final outputs of that algorithm are not gonna be very useful. This is tricky even without considering issues like uh, data that is partially observable uh, or something like this. So in this particular tutorial over the next uh, two hours uh, and 30, 40 minutes, we're going to try to attack the core problem by what we like to call neuralizing the algorithm. So what do I even mean by this term neuralizing an algorithm? It's a fairly, it's not a very well-defined term, but hopefully through a sequence of uh, uh, visual uh, uh, guided examples, we will get to the bottom of what does it mean to neuralize an algorithm. So, since we said there's this inherent divide between uh, you know, having the raw data that's given to us by nature and the actual inputs that an algorithm would expect, um, how do we bridge this gap? The problem is that previously we did this manual feature engineering on the raw data to make the algorithm applicable. But if you think back to the more recent history of deep learning, neural networks were basically built to solve this problem of manual feature engineering. Like the whole point of deep learning is to replace the human feature extractor with a neural network that's hooked up directly to the raw data. So let's try to do this in the first instance. So we take the same pipeline that we had before, but we replace the human feature extractor with a neural network encoder. So this neural network now maps your raw data uh, from these natural input space directly into the space of uh, abstract inputs that the algorithm expects. Then you execute the algorithm to get your outputs and somehow you then train this encoder using gradient descent over specific X, Y bar pairs. Now, you might initially think that this is a bit problematic because not all algorithms are easily amenable to backpropagation, as in they might not be differentiable, they might be heavily discrete, actually. However, uh, I would argue that this is not that much of a problem nowadays. There exist very nice established ways to perform backprop through arbitrary black box optimization functions. There's a lot of really cool work on these implicit neural network solver layers. My personal favorite uh, is the work of Marin Vlastelica and others that was in Eichler Spotlight a few years ago, Black Box Backprop, I would highly recommend it. We will, by the way, curate all the references that we mentioned during this talk on our tutorial website. So uh, don't worry if you don't catch all of the references during the tutorial itself. So, okay, maybe backpropagating through an algorithm is not that much of an issue, but there is actually a more fundamental issue, which we uh, call the algorithmic bottleneck. I will tell you about this issue informally, and then Andrea will, in the next part, tell you a bit more about specifically what it is and empirically demonstrating how it happens. But uh, a more fundamental issue with this pipeline is that you start with your very rich uh, raw natural data. You run your encoder to get algorithmic inputs, and at that point, you're fully committing, riveting yourself to whatever this algorithm gives you as output. So once you compute the algorithmic abstract inputs, you are fully trusting whatever comes out of it, and there's no way to go back. There's no way to revert any mistakes you might have made, right? And this, in many scenarios, actually leads to the algorithmic bottleneck problem, uh, which uh, arises in a variety of situations. For example, what if we don't have enough training data to properly estimate these inputs in the encoder? So we're predicting, once again, wrong inputs for the algorithm. So it doesn't matter that the algorithm is correct. The outcomes are still going to be bad. Or uh, even more fundamentally, what if we need to run more than one algorithm? So what if our outputs depend not only on Dijkstra's algorithm, but a few others as well? In the context of real world road network routing, if you route everyone using Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a greedy shortest path heuristic, you're likely going to send everyone in traffic on the same main road uh, in the road network, and therefore you're going to cause a massive congestion. So you might actually want something that's a bit more globally minded, has a little bit of Dijkstra, a little bit of flow analysis and so on. This particular pipeline would commit you to using Dijkstra's algorithm and that might be the wrong assumption in many cases. So there's a variety of, uh, there's a variety of moments where fully committing to an algorithm is actually not the best idea. 
And uh, this commitment is manifested in the fact that algorithms typically have these scalar level inputs. And uh, once you compute them, there's no going back. How do neural networks end up being more robust than these bottlenecks? Well, specifically, they are quite flexible because they have high dimensional latent space uh, um, data that they process. So these Z vectors that are say high dimensional real vectors. And because of this, they are more robust because if I poorly predict any dimensions of this latent vector, not all is lost. Other components of the vector could step in and finish the job. So to break our bottleneck, we're now going to get rid of the algorithm altogether and fully execute its computations in a latent space by doing a processor neural network P. So now we still have our encoder function as before, but now it doesn't map to algorithmic inputs. It maps to some high dimensional latent state Z. Then inside that latent state, we can iterate a processor network that maps latents to latents in a way that at some points we can decode the outputs uh, of the algorithm by running a decoder network on that latent state. Uh, this actually has a, a nice byproduct that uh, it naturally aligns with some existing established paradigms uh, in uh, deep learning research, such as the encode processor decode paradigm of Jess Hamrick. So assuming that I can give you this processor, this P network, such that somehow it aligns with the steps of the algorithm, we might actually have uh, everything we need, right? Because now you have a model of the algorithm that is high dimensional, so there's no bottlenecks. It's a neural network, so it's differentiable. There's no issues with gradients. And also you can do skip connections over P to fit uh, algorithms that uh, are residual. So anything which is not explained by P can be somehow fit by doing skip connections. So this might answer in one swoop all of the problems that we have, right? Is it that easy? Well, the reality is it is usually not that easy. So the question now is how can we actually obtain latent state neural networks like these P networks that somehow align with algorithms? And that is actually the main question that we're going to try to answer in many parts uh, of this tutorial. So this is what leads us to neural algorithmic reasoning, the art of building better processor networks that align better with the computations of a downstream algorithm. So you might be asking yourselves, like, you know, if this P is really just supposed to imitate computations of an algorithm, what's so different about this compared to any other, say, supervised learning uh, procedure, right? Any other ML task? Why do we need a new name for this? Why do we need to call it neural algorithmic reasoning? Well, specifically, it's because of the requirements of a network that claims to be algorithmic, that claims to be faithfully imitating an algorithm. Uh, because as we said, algorithms should work no matter what inputs you give to them, no matter how much it escapes the distribution of inputs you were looking at when you built the algorithm. Similarly, this neural network P should now also be reasonably capable even when you're extrapolating way out of distribution of the training set. And uh, as we all know, this out of distribution regime is one where neural networks tend to perform really, really badly. So this is the question. How can we build processor network speed that better extrapolate over these known algorithmic target functions? And that's what neural algorithmic reasoning is all about. So it's an emerging area that tries to build potent processor network speed, and it does so in a variety of ways. It can select specific architectural choices for either P or even the encoders and decoders that give you better algorithmic generalization or they might give you prescriptions on what to do with your input data and the transformations on the input data. And it, they might give you some advice on how to train the overall system altogether. So there's many different uh, additions, inductive biases and changes to the training regime uh, that neural algorithmic reasoning can recommend that makes this network P easier to build. And I want to now, this is the part of the talk where I give a bit of an outline of the related work, just so you have a good collection of references if you want to navigate the area. The tutorial part is really going to focus more on, you know, explicitly building these things and benchmarks that exist for building these things. But if you want a good set of references uh, for how to build these extrapolating models, this is the right place to be. So what do we know from a theoretical perspective? One of the key papers that we'll keep coming back to in various parts of this tutorial is uh, the paper uh, on what can neural networks reason about from Kei Luxu and others from MIT. And uh, this uh, is a paper that introduces the algorithmic alignment uh, concept. 
which says in a nutshell, we'll talk about this in a lot more detail later, that if you structurally align your model to the target algorithm, it means you're going to generalize better. And this uh, paper is also the first one that makes an informal observation that graph neural networks tend to align well with dynamic programming algorithms. Here at the bottom, you can see how we can line up the different steps of computation of a GNN on the right to the individual parts of the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which is a standard dynamic programming pathfinding algorithm on the left. And uh, specifically, this observation is the reason why we're telling you all of this in a graph neural network related conference, because we have good reason to believe that graph neural networks are the right tool to use for this particular class of models. However, it quickly became obvious that if you want extrapolation, just aligning the parts, just using a GNN for a dynamic programming task is not going to be enough. And uh, there was this really nice follow-up work that came the next year from the same group of people on how neural networks extrapolate, which has this very cool geometric argument that uh, if you assume that your uh, neural network functions, like the message functions of your GNN, are ReLU MLPs. So ReLU MLPs are basically piecewise linear functions. So if you go away sufficiently from the support of the training set, you're going to hit that linear region. So at that point, if your target functions there are not linear, uh, there's nothing you can do. Like, and they demonstrated very nicely with these visual examples that you see at the bottom. Here in light blue is the training set, and the target function is given in light gray. And you can see how a ReLU MLP basically, you know, once you escape the training data sufficiently, it has to learn a linear function. So if you haven't lined up your targets to be linear, you're not going to be able to extrapolate with ReLU. Um, and this then has several implications on ways in which we design parts of algorithmic GNNs. For example, here on the left, you can see changes to the network architecture. If you want to fit the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which minimizes over all of the neighbor's messages, you should be using a minimum aggregation in your GNN, because now suddenly the function you have to learn is linear. If you use some aggregation, as we know from GNN theory, this is sufficiently powerful to represent the function you care about, but the function that the MLP has to learn, the message function that goes into the sum, is now highly nonlinear and therefore not particularly useful for extrapolating. And uh, it also can inform ways to transform your input data that you see on the right, such that your task is easier to learn. Specific example they give here are n-body physics simulations. For example, if you have to simulate uh, the, uh, the force of gravity or something like that between the bodies. As you know, uh, gravity uh, is a force that depends on the inverse square of the distance. So if you just feed uh, the uh, distance as an edge feature between two objects in this system, that will not generalize very well. But if you put one divided by R squared as one of the features uh, in, your, in your edges, now suddenly the function you have to learn to compute the force is a linear function of your features. And therefore, it's going to be much easier to generalize. Uh, soon after, like already at the next conference, ICML 2021, there was this uh, really nice work from Beatrice Bevilacqua uh, in Bruno Ribeiro's group uh, at Purdue, which basically showed that this linear algorithmic alignment is just one instance of a far more general idea that if you want to extrapolate well, uh, you, need, uh, you need basically uh, to, uh, to carry a causal model of what your distributions will look like uh, during, uh, uh, during test time, okay? And the ReLU MLP linear argument is just one special case of such a model. So this paper, the size invariant graph representation paper at ICML 2021 showed uh, that uh, uh, if you have an explicit causal model of your graphs that you're carrying around, you're going to get better extrapolation on larger graphs. Another work, uh, which is uh, to some extent uh, tangential, but also a very interesting finding, is uh, the, the area of study of permutation compatible functions. We typically assume in neural algorithmic reasoning that we give good enough features to our GNN to properly specify the algorithm. So for example, if you're doing shortest pathfinding, you have a feature telling you which node is the source node, which is a bit of a symmetry breaking operation. However, in this paper from Feridunian and others on what functions can graph neural networks generate, they actually uh, test uh, what kinds of graph tasks can be done even if the features are not particularly indicative. So for example, if they're all constant features or something like that. And it turns out that there exist classes of algorithmic tasks that are what is known as permutation compatible. 
And for those tasks, the GNN should do well on them no matter what features you put in the nodes. Surprisingly, one such task is the minimum cut problem. Um, so basically, uh, if you want to solve min cut with GNNs, this is something that should be doable no matter what features you give to your model. Now, these are the main, these are the main four theoretical uh, insights that I wanted to highlight. What do we know from an empirical setting? There's a lot of empirical papers. Our group has been quite active in publishing quite a few of them. This is just a, a small sampler of a bunch of GNN architectures and other architectures that were proposed over the previous years that have shown that if you build parts of your GNN to line up better with a particular class of algorithms, you're gonna be better at building processor networks for those classes of algorithms. So here I just have a bucket list of these kinds of models. And on the right-hand side, you have what kinds of uh, algorithmic computations do they align with? So starting from the neural shuffle exchange networks that uh, align well with N log N linear rhythmic algorithms to our original work on neural execution of graph algorithms that aligns a bit better with dynamic programming, PrediNets that focus on predicate logic, iter GNNs that focus on iterative algorithms, and the more recent work we've done on pointer graph nets and persistent message passing, which uh, fits various kinds of data structures inside these models. Uh, however, it's not just about architectures. If you do nice and careful modifications to your training regime, you can also get very good algorithmic processors. So you can use various kinds of uh, algorithmically guided unsupervised learning, leading to this uh, NeurIPS oral from a few years ago from Nikos Karalias uh, on, uh, on Erdoshko's neural. Then uh, sometime later, there was this great work from Yehuda and others that showed you can use self-supervised learning to better generalize out of distribution. Shift size regularization that Davide Buffelli just now presented at NeurIPS, and also various uh, input feedback mechanisms, such as the recall mechanism uh, that was powering this recent uh, very impressive work from Bansal, Schwarzschild, and others at NeurIPS that uh, uh, basically learned this very strongly extrapolating maze solver. You might have seen it on Twitter. And another great uh, empirical finding that we've made uh, a few times over the years is that under certain circumstances, we can even learn multiple algorithms at once. So uh, the first paper to really deal with this problem in a bit more depth is Neural Executor++, which showed uh, some of the interesting building blocks for learning to execute multiple related algorithms together. And then in our recent work, the Generalist Algorithmic Learner, which is also a spotlight here at the log, we showed that if you're very careful about your choice of architectural biases and training regimes and data pipelines, you can even learn 30 completely uh, dissimilar algorithms inside the same architecture. So this hopefully gives you a nice bucket list of ideas and references to look back to after this tutorial. Once again, no worries if you haven't caught all of them, we will carefully put them all on the tutorial website after the tutorial is over. Uh, but what I would like to focus the last part uh, of, my, of my section on developing algorithmic reasoning is to show you some existing benchmarks if you want to get in on the action of learning good processor networks and if you want to play around with these models more directly, and that is uh, our work on the CLRS benchmark, specifically CLRS 30, which is its latest incarnation that has 30 algorithmic tasks. So specifically, what do we mean by CLRS? CLRS are actually the initials of the four authors of the Introduction to Algorithms textbook, Corman, Lacerson, Rivest, and Stein. Uh, this is arguably, I think, one of the best-selling uh, science textbooks there is. And uh, it's basically uh, a common hallmark on almost every undergraduate computer scientist's virtual or physical bookshelf. So we thought it was a very nice and recognizable way to uh, curate a collection of skills that we would want our algorithmic processor networks to learn. And specifically in our benchmark, we selected uh, a collection of 30 algorithmic problems that uh, come from this textbook and span a wide variety of skills, sorting, searching, pathfinding, dynamic programming, string matching, geometric algorithms, and so on. And this benchmark is actually publicly available. You can go to our GitHub uh, at DeepMind CLRS. You can also read our paper, which was accepted at ICML this year, which details the construction of the benchmark uh, and uh, the various models that we tested on it in the first instance. So this is something you can directly play with. And in my collab section towards the end of this part of the tutorial, I will show you how you can, in a very few lines of code, play with some CLRS models very quickly. 
So let's talk, before we dive into the code, let's talk a little bit about how CLRS was built so that you understand a bit better what it does internally under the hood. So if in the future you want to hack it in a certain way, you'll know how to do it. So what's special about CLRS? We've kind of taken all these 30 algorithms and we've boiled them down to a common graph representation. This in part was done to enable us to more easily execute them together, but we also thought that graphs were a very nice generic representation for a lot of these problems. And specifically, for every algorithm, we specify a fixed number of what we call probes. A probe is just some variable that the algorithm manipulates during its execution, and we want to track it so that we can then ask a neural network to imitate how that variable changes, right? So whatever a probe is, it might be given to the model as input, the model might be asked to predict them as output, or it might use them as both inputs and outputs and predict their evolution over time. And specifying the probes, once you do that, and CLRS has a very, in my opinion, intuitive way to specify the probes, it uniquely determines not only what shape your data set is going to have, but also the entire encoder, decoder, and loss function architecture of your model. So one of the really nice conveniences of CLRS 30 is that it's more of a data set or baseline generator rather than a single data set. So you build your particular algorithmic task, you specify it using the language of probes, and then you let CLRS build for you a bunch of baseline models rather than having to build baseline models yourself. This is one of the things that we hope will democratize this neural algorithmic reasoning research and make it more accessible to more people. So let's look at the specific example so you can get a feel for what this looks like. For example, the insertion sort algorithm we talked about before, it has six probes. And here you can see immediately every probe has a name. So here you have pause, which is the positional embedding of each node. So it tells you which node starts at index zero, index one, and so on. We know it's at the input stage. So it's given as input to the model. Uh, it's living in the nodes. So we know for every node of our list uh, what position it has. And it's of scalar type. So there is a real number that specifies this positional coordinate for the node. Then you need the actual values that you want your algorithm to sort. So we have the key probe, which is also at the input stage, also lives in the nodes, and is also a scalar. So we have a bunch of nodes, and each one of those nodes has a position embedding, and it has a uh, key. And now we want to sort the values according to those keys. What we want the model to predict is a sorted list, specifically because we're going to treat all these things with GNNs, and GNNs are permutation invariant we're actually going to uh, not predict uh, like values in each one of the nodes, but rather we're going to predict uh, who's the predecessor of whom in the sorted list. And therefore, our predecessors is the corresponding output, our final node ordering. And it's what we call a node pointer. So every node has a pointer to another node that's being stored and predicted. And basically, for every node, you choose which node is its predecessor in the sorted array. Now. These are the inputs and outputs, and every single sorting algorithm has those inputs and outputs. What uh, specifically is related to insertion sort are the hints, so the intermediate states that change as the algorithm does its magic. The first one, predH, tracks how these uh, predecessor pointers change during the lifetime of the algorithm. So basically, it's tracking what your list looks like every step of the way as different elements get swapped. Then you have the two indices, i and j, that we talked about uh, uh, in the initial pseudocode that I showed you. So the names of these variables have been chosen to fairly closely align with the pseudocode um, of, uh, of these algorithms uh, that are in the CLRS textbook. And specifically, this is also a hint. So it's a trajectory that changes over, over time, over many steps. I and J are two specific nodes that we're looking at right now. So what's the node I'm currently trying to insert in my list? And where is it being inserted? That's what I and J are tracking. And that's why the type for those I and J are mask one types. So it's basically a one hot over all of the nodes. So as you can see, a probe can be either an input if it's given to the model as input, an output if it's to be predicted at the very end, or a hint if it's a trajectory that uh, you can feed hints at time t and predict hints at time t plus one. So inputs and outputs are fixed and the hints change during execution. They're the thing that actually specifies the algorithm because every single sorting algorithm will have exactly the same pause key and pred. It's the hints that actually define how the algorithm operates. And that's the thing we might be really interested in fitting. So 
once we have all these probes, let's talk a little bit about how they're fed into a GNN. So I mentioned we have this pause probe, which initially is just the scalar that tells you for every node in the list what's its index, and it's normalized to, to not be bigger than one. And we run it through like the CLRS library builds for you an encoder function. It's a simple linear layer that uh, is executed over these uh, scalars and it's given as a node feature, right? Then you do the same thing. These are the keys that you want to sort. Those keys are fed through another linear layer that's constructed by default and the results are all summed together. So in the nodes now you have features that are the sum of the initial output of the linear layer and the other output of the linear layer. And now you might also have these predecessor pointers, which are, are hints. So you can take uh, what the list looked like at time t. For example, this is one possible state of the list of these predecessor pointers. How do we embed this in the graph net? We turn it into an adjacency matrix. Uh, and then we embed that adjacency matrix to get edge features. So basically all the edges that are part of the currently uh, partially sorted list are going to get this feature vector X resulting from applying a linear encoder. Once again, this is all automatically built by the benchmark. You don't have to do any of this by yourself. And you can also encode I and J, which as we said, are these one hot representations of these two pointers. And uh, those are then also separately encoded and the results are added together to get final node representations. So once you're done encoding all of this, you have some edge features and some node features. You might also have some graph level features, but not for insertion sort doesn't have any graph level data. You also keep track of a node's hidden state, which changes through time. And that's what goes as input to one step of your processor network. Initially, the hidden state is initialized to something like all zeros. And the GNN processor then, based on all these three pieces of information, performs message passing over these features to update the hidden state. So this orange vector is computed, which should be the hidden state for the next step. And once you have all of these pieces of data, you can try to decode all of the hints that you have in your model if you're asking the model to predict hints in the next step. So for example, we have a bunch of hints that are of type mask one. We can take for every node, the three pieces of information we have on them, the input features, the previous hiddens, the next hiddens. And we run once again, a pre-built decoder network, which computes logits for computing what's the next uh, uh, node that I will point to. And you can then use the standard softmax cross entropy to uh, optimize this. Similarly for J. And you also have, if you have like pointer type uh, hints, you can do this on the level of edges. So for all pairs of nodes, you can take the relevant features uh, of those two nodes and the edge features between them run it through a decoder. Once again, this is all pre-built for you. And this now gives you logits for every possible pair of nodes. And then you can do row-wise softmax to choose uh, what the pointers will be in the next step for every node. And similarly, when the time comes, you also do this. Our, our library deals with this for you uh, to stop at the right time and to run the output model to, in the same way, decode the output array when everything is ready. And the way all of this is trained is then you have ground truth values that come from the trajectory or from the output of the algorithm and you do the appropriate loss function. Once again, this is all automatically selected by the library based on the type that you specify. So for both mask one and pointers, the loss function will actually be softmax cross entropy against the ground truth distributions. So uh, this is a rough overview of what a CLRS model will do for you. So all of this will be done for you by the library. You don't have to write a single line of code to do this. And now uh, I'm going to take you into the collab so you can uh, see for yourself just how uh, simple this can be. So uh, if you have uh, access to collab, you might want to code along. If you don't, no worries. We're going to release all of these collabs after the tutorial. So uh, please just feel free to follow the tutorial in any way you find uh, appropriate. So this is, you know, a standard basic collab that we're going to try to do various uh, computations in. The first thing we need to do, because uh, the CLRS library is not uh, included uh, in the default collab, um, uh, collab pipeline, you need to pip install it. So we're going to start by doing that. Uh, just wait for it to connect to a runtime. But yeah, if you run pip install dmclrs, this is the easiest way to hook up to our GitHub repository. 
Although if you want the latest and greatest features, including the code for our general list learner, you might want to do pip install directly from GitHub rather than doing pip install DMCLRS. But for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just keeping it simple. So we're just waiting for uh, the uh, pip to finish installing. Yeah, so the pip command finished successfully. I will cut the, the, the trace just to avoid clouding the view. We're gonna start with a few imports. So once you've pip installed DMCLRS, uh, you, should be, uh, you should be able to just import CLRS and that will have all the tools you need. Uh, we're also gonna be using various other imports like NumPy and also JAX. Uh, CLRS models that are provided by default uh, are written in JAX, but uh, if you just want to hook up to the data in NumPy format and use it for something else, you can also do that. But because we're also gonna be working with the models, we need to also import JAX. And uh, there's a library I import, so I can pretty print a dictionary at one point during the tutorial. Uh, JAX models require you to have uh, a, um, a uh, random uh, key at all times that you continuously update. So I'm just using these two lines to create uh, a random key in JAX. No worries if you don't know uh, how this works, it's not critical for the tutorial. So we're just waiting for these imports to, to be completed. And that's all good. And uh, also another fun thing to note, uh, so there is no GPU or TPU on this particular uh, collab instance. So this is to show you if you want to do quick and dirty experiments in CPU, you should be able to do that for a lot of these tasks. Like they are not particularly intensive to train if you just want to play around. So um, how do we then, now that we have the CLRS data set, how do we then ask it to generate certain kinds of algorithmic tasks for us? It's actually quite simple. So uh, we have the CLRS build sampler function, which has a lot of uh, fun parameters, but the ones you'll most likely gonna want to use is the name of the algorithm you want to imitate. In this case, we'll be using Bellman Ford, which is a standard uh, shortest path finding algorithm. You can specify how many examples you want in your data set. Here, I'm going to ask for 100 uh, inputs uh, for my data set. So 100 trajectories of the algorithm. And uh, you can specify how many nodes you want to have uh, in your graphs. So as we said, what we traditionally do in algorithmic reasoning is we train on a smaller size graphs, and then we test uh, on graphs that are much bigger. So in this particular case, I'm going to build a training sampler of graphs of size 16, and then I'm going to build a test sampler of graphs of size 64. Okay. Now, one thing that's very convenient is that when you call build sampler, it doesn't just return the sampler that will generate data for you. It also returns the algorithmic specification, which uh, is all of that nice dictionary of probes that you can use to then construct your models, encoders, decoders, loss functions, and everything else. So yeah, this is all you need to construct your data. Uh, here, I'm just going to pretty print the specification so that we can see what data for Bellman Ford looks like. And uh, also because I'm for this demo, I'm just going to loop the data forever in a training loop. I added this convenience function, which wraps around my data sampler to continuously give me uh, batches of inputs uh, until, uh, you know, until forever. So uh, you can then specify a batch size for the training set. I use a batch size of 32. For the test set, I actually do full batch so I can easily evaluate the performance on the test set. So we are going to run this block of code now. And um, once it's done, you can see now this prettified printing of all the probes that the Bellman Ford algorithm uses. So you have uh, an input telling you the graph structure that you're computing shortest paths over, and also both in mask form, which just tells you what are the edges of the graph, and in scalar form, which tells you what are the weights of the edges. You also have the positional embedding of all the nodes, as we discussed before. You also have an identifier, a mask one, telling you which node is the source node, because this uh, Bellman Ford is a single source shortest path algorithm, and therefore uh, it's expecting you to give it uh, a source vertex to start from, right? And uh, what the model needs to predict is that shortest path tree I showed you near the start of my presentation. So for every node in the graph, it should predict uh, who is its predecessor in the tree of shortest paths from the source node. And your hint corresponds to predicting the intermediate distances to every single node. That's the descaler over here. And also predicting how these uh, predecessor pointers change through time. 
So basically a specification as you would expect. And you can easily support new algorithms by defining their spec and by showing how to capture their data uh, according to the spec. So once I have this, I can now build my own uh, processor network as well as all the encoders and decoders. So to do this, I need to first define a processor factory, which is a CLRS function that will create processor networks for me for a particular type. In this case, I use the message passing neural network. So I put MPNN in quotes. There's many fun parameters you can put in this function. Here, I just say I wanted to use layer norm because I know layer norm is particularly effective here. And uh, then you can specify a dictionary of various hyperparameters that you want your model to use. So the hidden dimension, do I encode hints? Do I decode hints? Uh, do I do teacher forcing or not? Uh, do I use an LSTM for every step? What's the learning rate? You know, basically a lot of these are just standard deep learning hyperparameters that you can specify. There's a lot more options to choose from, but uh, here I've just chosen some of the more standard ones you might want to play with. And uh, because this is JAX, to initialize a JAX model, you actually need to show it one trajectory, which is plausible looking. So I immediately generate a dummy trajectory by asking the train sampler for a batch of data. And now I have everything I need to ask CLRS to build me my whole neural network and loss functions for me. So model is equal to CLRS baseline model, where I feed it this aforementioned algorithmic spec as an input. I give it one dummy trajectory so it knows what to play with. And I give it this entire dictionary of hyperparameters to build the model from. And I can then immediately call Jax's initialization function using the dummy trajectories features and some random seed for the initialization, one, two, three, four. So we're gonna execute this now. And uh, you'll see that uh, very quickly, indeed in four seconds, we have a neural network model all with uh, SGD uh, functions and loss functions baked into it. So now we can just write our training loops. So we start uh, our training from uh, step zero and uh, we continue training, say we're trained for just 100 steps to keep it simple. And uh, at every step, uh, we take some data from both the train sampler and the test sampler, though we will only run on the test set uh, for some specific steps, so not immediately. Uh, as we said, uh, JAX requires you to give a random uh, number generator key at every single step of running the model. So we just run JAX random split to obtain a new RNG key every single step of the way. And now we can run the core function of training the model, which is called model.feedback, where we give it the current key that we have and the feedback, which is the batch that we sampled from the training set. And that's it. This function will do one step of gradient descent on that batch of data, and it will conveniently retrieve the loss for us. So we know what the loss uh, value is across predicting all the hints and predicting the outputs. And we, let's say we might want to periodically evaluate our model. Uh, in this particular case, I'm using the test set as a validation set. I would not recommend this uh, at all times, but uh, uh, just to illustrate how easy it is to do in a short amount of code, not to do stuff like early stopping and so on. So every 10 steps of the way, I'm going to call model predict to generate the model's predictions on both the training set and the test set. And I'm going to use this handy CLRS evaluate function that uh, looks at the ground truth outputs from this batch and the predictions made by your model. And it gives you a dictionary containing all sorts of performance metrics across all of your hints. Here we will just focus on the score metric, which is the overall performance of the algorithm. And we're going to print you know, uh, every 10 steps, what's the loss, what's the validation accuracy, what's the test accuracy. So let's execute this line of code and see how fast is this on a CPU. All right, Jax is currently compiling the tree. And yeah, we have loss, for, uh, loss and accuracies for step zero. And you should start to see things pop up for step 10 and so on. So you can see in a very small amount of code, we went from basically no model at all to a fully built algorithmic model that imitates these intermediate trajectories. And that's really where the magic of the CLRS library is. It allows you to build these things in a very small amount of code if you just want to play around with various variations of these models. And uh, if you want to hack it and build more specific use cases, we hope we've made it as easy as possible as well. 
But if you do have any questions at any point, you should always feel free to reach out to us uh, and uh, solicit uh, any thoughts. And here you can see that this model has uh, now ran for 100 steps and it took only one minute. And you can see the validation accuracy shoots up very quickly. So in distribution, we're learning to fit this data quite nicely. However, uh, outside uh, of the distribution, the improvements are much more slower. And this is the main divide that I kept telling you about. So the typical requirements of a supervised learning model to do well in distribution are much easier to satisfy than requiring it to perform significantly out of distribution. Now, in the case of Bellman Ford with this particular model, if you kept training for longer and longer, eventually the test accuracy would also get really good, but it would take a lot more time. And uh, it's not as easy to do model selection if you just rely on in distribution validation. So you can see all of the other papers that I referenced here for specific tricks uh, that we can use uh, to make this happen. So. This concludes uh, the playground part uh, of this uh, of this uh, tutorial. I am going to uh, just quickly uh, go back to the uh, uh, to my slide deck uh, just to kind of recap where we were. We just returned from collab time, and hopefully we uh, went through an interesting journey in developing algorithmic reasoning techniques which uh, led to us exploring the various related work in the area, the CLRS benchmark. And we've seen on a concrete example, how you can build a CLRS model and evaluate it uh, in only a handful of lines of code, which I hope you will find useful if you're interested in this kind of research uh, going forward. On that note, I would like to thank you so much for following the first part of this tutorial. I am now going to hand over to Andrea for the second part of the tutorial. Thank you very much for, for listening. We heard a bit about how to how to build neural algorithmic reasoners. In the next part of the tutorial, we'll we'll talk about how to deploy them. Um, and by deploy, I still mean in research. Uh, although I, I would be very keen to see uh, like real life applications very soon. And I think we're getting there. But but for now, let's talk about what we've done. Uh, so yeah, my name is Andrea. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Mila University of Montreal in the group of Professor, Professor Gentan, and I've been working in this on this field for for the last one and a half, two years, I guess. Um, and I'll mostly focus on, on some of the work I've done, um, in, including the neural algorithmic reasoners are implicit planners, which were, was a spotlight at NeurIPS last year. Uh, and I'll try to, to do the, the brave thing of coding it from pretty much from scratch in this, in this demo. Um, but because I'm, I'm doing this, uh, I will, there's a lot of code involved. So I'll, I'll aim overall to give you a feeling of what this means, how you can use your, build your own neural algorithmic reasoner and how to use it, uh, which I think is something quite easy to do now that we know more about how, how this works. Okay, so the, the pipeline um, Peter already mentioned, there, there are a lot of cases where we know we have some abstract inputs and we know we'd like to apply some algorithm on it. So we can pre-train a processor to, to learn this algorithm and give us some abstract outputs. But in most of the time, the, the real life doesn't work like this. It won't give us like abstractified inputs uh, to, to our model. We have to do like our own processing of, of images or of whatever nature gives us. So for, you can think of, for example, for, for traffic, for transportation, um, what, what we conceptually want is to do some sort of shortest path. Um, but it's not as easy as that because we, we need to first find like the coordinates or something like that, or like some, some description of the location. Um, and then from there, get from like a, from our current location to the to the point we, we want to reach, uh, which does involve some algorithm underneath. But um, the inputs and the outputs are usually in 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 not not in numbers, not in not in the inputs the algorithm will take them. Okay, so let's do like some some recap in a way because why are we like what's the whole idea of this? Uh, well, we have like. Traditionally, we have like two uh, two types of traditionally and more recently, I guess, uh, we have two types of problems problem solving solving approaches, uh, algorithms, which is what what we learn in computer science for for some some time in uh, in some courses, um, and we have like neural networks, which have been like we have which have shined in the last few years, um, and what are the, their benefits and their cons in a way? So, 
for algorithms, we know they, they trivially strongly generalize. Like if I apply my algorithm or on inputs of different sizes, as long as they fit the, the criteria of the input specification, um, they will work. Their algorithm will give me what they, what they expect it to give me. And then their composition also, I can easily put like put multiple algorithms together and still get something that makes sense out of it. Uh, and they're guaranteed to be correct if I give it correct like, inputs that match the, the specification, uh, I will get something that is definitely correct outside. Uh, if there's no bug, but this, this is not on, on the algorithm. Um, and they have interpretable operations because we can look exactly in, in what's going on and we know exactly how, how things are computed. Uh, but as I, as, I, as I kept mentioning, they, have, they must have uh, specific specifications. So for example, for, for, uh, for shortest path, I need to think what are my nodes, what are my edges? What are the, the weights on my edges? And all of this requires like some thinking uh, from, from somebody at some point. Uh, and they're not robust to task variations. So I can't, I can't give like a, a, a graph and ask, ask, it, ask the algorithm to compute something else or, um, or something like that. Well, well neural networks, um, they operate on, on raw inputs. So I don't need to do any of, of, the, of the handling of the engineering on top of them. Um, and they generalize to noisy conditions. Um, so even if my inputs are not exactly, are not like if my, so let's think a bit in, in terms of the previous one. Um, so if my, if my age is not actually seven, it's actually 7.2, but I said seven, uh, a neural network will sort of abstractify that away and to get the, the gist of it. Uh, ideally with enough data, uh, that, that's what we've seen. Um, and then models are reusable across tasks. Um, so I can like use a, a, a convolutional neural network or ResNet on all different or different types of data, uh, and it will still give me something that's useful in most of the cases. But uh, as we know, they require big data to to do like to to tackle the more challenging tasks, uh, and they are unreliable when extrapolating um, the sort of like out of distribution generalization sort of is one example um, and they lack inter inter interpretability while, while we're, there's a lot of work in this i think we still mostly don't know what they're what they're learning and like we can't think of of their operations directly so ideally we would like to get the best of both worlds um, which is probably something in between or something like the neural algorithmic reasoner um, and as we as we've already thought a bit about like how to how to build this and like what this really means, like let's look at the case study for for the rest of for for this part of the tutorial. Uh, and I like I like reinforcement learning, so this is what I've been working on. Um, so I'll give you a bit of of how to use the neural algorithmic reasoner in reinforcement learning. But don't worry if you haven't worked on RL. Um, this won't require like a lot of baseline, a lot of like background knowledge, I will try to get it, get it from, from the ground up. So when we talk about RL, we're talking about some agent that has some observation of the world, acts on, on the world, um, and then gets a new observation. Um, when acting, ideally we, we don't want to act like randomly, we want to do like some plan and update our plan, and using that plan act like in a more meaningful way to, get, to, to obtain better results. So what are these results I'm referring to? So usually we think of results in terms of rewards. So this is something that we get from the world after doing an, uh, an action in a state. Um, and there are other things that we should consider. So for example, the policy is what action the, the agent chooses to take when it's in a current state. And the transition is what is the probability of a next state? So basically what, they, what, what is the expected, uh, like what do I expect to get after I am in a state and I do an action? Um, and the whole idea of, of the RL is that we want to optimize for this counted cumulative reward. So basically what I get back from the world, I want it to, to add up to more and more like better and better rewards. Um, okay, so this is like a high level, high level RL point. So let's, let's see what this means. Uh, I started a bit the call up because I didn't want to, to wait for a lot of installation, but it actually requires quite a few packages. Um, okay, so we have our RL agent and we start like conceptually, we can think a bit like this, like the agent has some observation of the world, basically like you look along, looks around, this is what it sees, uh, that sort of idea. Uh, and based on this, it chooses, it decides on an action. 
So this is like the, the policy, basically. It's in a state. It, it, it gives a probability for, for all actions. And usually it like chooses the best one. Uh, and after taking this action, the word responds with a reward, a signal whether the episode is done. Now I'm talking like more from the implementation side. Uh, for example, in the case of games, the game, the episode is done when either the agent wins or loses or times out if it, in case it hasn't done anything interesting in a very long time. Um, and it also gets an updated observation. Okay, so let's see what, what does this mean. So for, for this tutorial, uh, I look at the mountain car, which is one of the environments we also used in the paper. Uh, and I start with a random agent. So random an agent that does random actions. Okay, so how, do, how does this look? Basically, I have my environment and I'll, I'll, try, I'll start stepping in this environment. I'll get some signal and I'll, I'll add up my, my, my return. So let's see by acting randomly, what's happening? Will it get anything meaningful? Well, I, I did two episodes. I could do much more, but I don't want to, to waste our time. Um, and I got minus 400 in total. So it's like minus 200, I can tell you, because this is basically the, the worst score I can get a mountain car. The agent doesn't do anything to get to the goal, basically. Uh, OK, let me show you exactly what this, what this looks like, because I think it will make a lot more sense uh, when you see it. So I, I, I'm putting together all the frames the agent has seen, so all the observations, and hopefully an animation should show up very quickly. This is the, the main part where we have to wait. Okay, there it is. So this is my mountain car. The goal is to get up the hill. Uh, but the, the thing is, we can't just blindly accelerate forward and expect to get up the hill because you need some momentum. Uh, so a random agent won't actually discover anything. That's why it's not, not getting any positive reward. And you can see it for yourself. Basically, this is what a random agent will do. It just, it will just move back, like backwards and forward without getting anywhere. And we, it stopped. So now we're seeing the second episode. Okay, now it got a bit of momentum, but with random, it doesn't do much. Okay, so this is basically the mountain car. Uh, you can you can see it like we, we looked at a random agent. Uh, now, okay, let's let's leverage the power of deep learning and let's look at like let's actually learn something. So I, I'm starting by setting like a bunch of hyperparameters. Uh, they are quite standard. So like things like how many actions are in the environment and how 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 what's the imp the observation dimension? It's two, so it's like x and y. Um, and then I'll have an encoder. So basically, from my observation, now I'll actually look at it. I won't act randomly uh, ignoring it. So from my observation, I'll encode it. Uh, I'm using like some linear layers, nothing very fancy. Um, and then after I encoded it, now I'm in my latent space, I can try to predict stuff such as uh, a policy. So I can basically use data, use my trajectories, uh, to act and learn from this acting uh, so that I can improve on what I'm doing. Um, now, this is like, this will be some boilerplate. Basically, the re reinforcement learning, uh, I have to do some acting phase, gather some data. This is, that's my data set in a way, if, if you're more familiar with the supervised learning setup. And then from this data set, I'm, I'm learning basically what, what worked and what didn't work, and I'm improving my, my, my policy. So after... Like this is my my uh, rollout storage. Basically, I have my observations, my rewards, what I predicted as a valuable state, and some uh, probability for the actions. Um, and uh, I'll put all of this together. So basically, I'm constructing my data set from acting. Uh, this is some some stuff I need to do. So basically, to get tensors out of my environment. Okay, and this is the part where I gather the data. So I basically I reset my environment. I have some some fresh hill to, to try to climb on. Uh, and I, I'll use my policy to act. So basically I'll predict some action and I'll, I'll do it in the environment and I'll get some stuff out. Uh, and then basically I'm recording all of this. Okay, and this is the part where I'm learning from, from the data. So basically after I gathered a few of these episodes, a few of these trajectories, I'm looking at what, how much return did I get? What were, what were the actions I predicted? And I'm trying to adjust this 
to, to bid towards the, the return that was higher. But the thing is, this, this PPO agent, which is a strong agent for, for RL, um, and I won't focus too much on it because the, the whole idea of the paper is that I can change this uh, and the, the whole agent will, will, will work. So you can think of it as just, I'm looking at the data and I'm trying to get a loss to improve my encoder and my policy uh, and my value heads. So basically I'm trying to improve what I'm predicting to act in the world. And let's put them all together. So I have my encoder, I have my, my actor. So the policy that deciding what to act on. And you can see basically my actor is not doing any better. So now I have 10 episodes aggregated over, over every step and I have 2000 returns. So basically it's not doing much. Um, because it's not seeing any solution by acting randomly. It basically doesn't know where the, what to do to get to get anywhere better. And I can tell you this one, this one improve um, just by itself. So, okay, so we need to, to go back to the drawing board and figure out something better to do. This is where you might expect it. This is where the algorithms come, come in. Okay, so uh, planning is something that can be useful when we're in situations like this, because policies that act just by reacting to, to the observed rewards are, are called reactive, and they require a lot of data and there's a lot of depth. And in some cases, they might not find a, a, a way out. So planning ameliorates this by trying to build a, a, a model of the world. So basically trying to understand better the world and what, what it would mean to, to be in a state and take, take an action, trying to imagine what the state, next state would look like. So that's a state transition model. And they can also try to, to predict what the reward would be. Uh, and they are typically trained from observed trajectories. And the idea is that if I know what would happen, then I know, like if I, if I can try to imagine what would happen, I know what are good actions and bad actions to take. So overall, I can, I can discover better, better solutions rather than just blindly acting and seeing what happens. Okay, so using these models, a planner can simulate the effect of actions before taking them. And it comes with many benefits as you might expect. Uh, and it's something we, we generally do. So I don't think any of this will, will come as a surprise. Planning is useful. So it comes in gains in data efficiency, a good model implies, implies fewer interactions I needed to learn to act. And strong models are uh, allow quickly adapting to previously unexplored situations. Um, so if I, if I understand the world, even if I'm in a new situation, I still sort of know what to do or what's dangerous and what I should avoid. Um, so that's the high level idea. And I can be mindful of the consequences of acting, um, which means I will have better safety. And overall, this, this idea of planning has been quite impactful for game playing in AlphaGo um, and in, in the, across the sciences. So for, for retrosynthesis, I think this was, this was uh, one, of the, one of the points that made the, the model useful. Okay, um, and it's also encouraging theoretically. If I have a perfect model of the world, I can get perfect policies. So with that means if I perfectly understand the word, I can, I can know exactly how to act to get the highest reward I could get. Okay, this all sounds good, but how, how do I actually do this? So the way I do it uh, is using an algorithm. Of course, we're talking about Miller algorithmic reasoning. Uh, this algorithm is value iteration. Uh, it's in a way similar to the algorithm Peter talked about, Bellman Ford, but, but let's, let's uh, just look at it basically. So value iteration, what it does is I have my states and I'm trying to compute um, some estimates of, of how valuable, so what the, what the value of these states is. And the way I'll compute these values is by looking at the neighboring states of, of where I'm currently at and looking at its value and try to update my current estimate based on how valuable my neighboring states are. Because of course, from where I currently am, I'll take an action that will give me a reward and then I'll get into some of the neighboring states. So basically my value depends on my neighbors. Okay, and this is, so the, in a way, maybe like if you're, if you're, if you come from the graph representation learning land, you, you can see sort of this is like, we're doing like some information propagation here. We were looking at neighbors, at their information, we're updating our current representation with the neighboring information. Uh, but the, the nice part about this algorithm is that it's guaranteed to converge to optimal solutions. So if I start, even if I start from random estimates of values, uh, I am guaranteed to get to, to optimal uh, value estimates if I keep iterating, basically. Okay, so this is a nice algorithm. Um, 
but if we look at it in a very particular instance, uh, and which is the, the one of grid words, uh, maybe you can get an even better feeling of what, what this algorithm does. So assuming that the probability of getting from here to the neighboring state is, is fixed and known, um, basically I can only get to the neighboring, to the four, like up, down, left, right. Um, this means that this would be my neighbors from which I ag aggregate my, my values and I update my value estimate. Basically, this is what, what this amounts to is doing convolution over, over the grid. Um, and that's very neat because we know how we know some neural networks that do very well convolution. Uh, and that's exactly the idea of value iteration networks. So in value iteration networks, they assume the MDP. So basically the, the Markov decision process, which, which stays of the, of the states, the actions, the transition matrix uh, is discrete, fixed and known. So it, it, you can think of it, it pretty much looks like this. Uh, they, that's, that's one of the cases they looked at. And we can perform value iteration style computation by putting stacking convolutional networks on top of convolutional layers, which give us a network on top of this. And it's awesome because this gives us a differentiable planning module. Um, and there are some extensions on going be, beyond uh, grids. Uh, so there, there are some that looks at graphs, uh, but there's a, a bunch of limitations of doing it this way. So even if I use a convolutional neural network of, on top of my grid, this has some very strong assumptions that I know everything about my Markov decision process and that it's fixed. Um, and we never need to estimate transition models and we didn't, we didn't deal with continuous state spaces. Um, but what happens with, when we don't know the MDP? We don't know uh, what, what's my next state or we don't know like the rewards. Um, yeah, like what's, what's happening when we have missing information? And while it could learn, like while a convolutional neural network, because it aligns nicely with this computation, it could learn to do value iteration, it doesn't have to, right? There is nothing that, that, it, that we didn't push this in any way to make sure that this learned value iteration. So now we know an algorithm that's useful. We found like a very specific case where we could use a neural network, but we didn't quite push it like all the way. So let's push it all the way in the style of neural algorithmic reasoning. So Assuming we have encoded our state uh, into embeddings, now we can, we can learn a, mo a, mo a model to expand the local MDP. So basically we don't know the, the MDP, but we'll, we'll build it from what, we, what we've seen, the data we've seen so far. So basically uh, like we're in our current state, we'll take actions we, and using the transition model, we'll get our, our assumption of what the next state would look like. Um, and there's many different ways to learn the transition model. Um, contrastive learning being one of the more successful ones. But basically now we're in the situation like where we were in the situation of like our natural inputs. We had to uh, do manual figuring out of how to compute it, to transform it into abstract inputs. And we applied our algorithm and get our, our abstract output. Uh, but because we have the transition model, maybe we can do something a bit better than that. We can we can use the power of deep learning. Uh, basically, we can use the use a learned transition model on every action to be exhaustive. Um, so basically, we'll have our frame. We embed it using a normal embedder. Uh, it can be like a convolutional neural network in this case because we have a frame. And then we'll take all actions and expand the local MDP using our transition model. So basically we're building the MDP that we don't, we don't know, we can't assume much about. And if we do this, we can run our, uh, our value iteration algorithm on top of that. And it's exactly what this paper did, TQ and A3C. Uh, basically using a transition model and the reward model, you, we have everything we need to run some form of value iteration. Uh, and then we can use these Q values to uh, directly decide the policy uh, and we can do the backup. So we have everything we need to visualize it. It basically like, looks like this. So this is our frame. You can imagine like uh, any game or any, anything like where, you, where you've seen reinforcement learning applied, this could be it. We have our encoder. And then what we do, you have the transition model, as I was saying, we taking all actions, we build our MDP. We have some, some reward and value estimates, and then we basically update them and do the backup. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's do a recap. So we mapped our natural inputs to the space of abstract in inputs. We are, all, we are just in latent space now. 
using a transition model. So something that predicts me what if I am in a state and I take an action predicts me what the next state would look like. I can build a tree. So basically I can imagine different trajectories um, and I can compute also reward values in every node. Uh, using something like TrickQN, this allowed us to execute value style, uh, value, value iteration style algorithms directly on the abstract inputs. And as this is differentiable, uh, so is our in entire implicit planner. However, um, Peter mentioned something earlier, and now, now I'll, I hope I'll convince you that this is an important problem while I'll, I'll hammer it home. So basically, the real-world data is often incredibly rich, and to, to run an algorithm, we have to compress it down to scalar values. Um, however, whenever, whenever we do this, we, we use uh, something to predict some scalar values on top of which we'll run an algorithmic solver. This algorithm assumes that the inputs that I fed it in are the inputs I really wanted to, like I really wanted to use. Uh, so assumes that it in, these inputs are perfect and it will give me an, an answer basically for the inputs I fed in. However, as this is something I predicted using a neural network, this is possibly not exactly what, what it should have been. And if, if I'm at the beginning of training or I haven't seen sufficient data to estimate these scalars, we hit data efficiency, data efficiency issues, which was which is a bit ironic because that's, a, that's exactly what planning was trying to fix. So the thing to remember is that if I, if I run a, an algorithm on top of something that was predicted, um, especially if this, these predictions are suboptimal, which will happen, uh, if, especially if I haven't trained for long, then the algorithm will give me a solution, but it's, in a, it's, it's not in the environment I, I think I'm solving the problem. Okay, how do we go about fixing it? So neural networks derive great flexibility from latent representations. Um, and ideally we would want to stay there. We would want to stay in latent space in, in a high dimensional space, space where if something is poorly predicted, then other parts of the latent space basically can overcompensate. Can, can compensate. And overall I can, I, I, I can get closer to the answer. So to break the bottleneck, instead of using uh, some, some human feature engineering to get from frame some, some inputs. I'll use the neural network to get, get me a high dimensional embedding. Um, then this is, you can think of it like in, in these cases, like my local MDP that I slowly constructed. Uh, and on top of this, I can run the neural network instead of the value iteration algorithm or whatever algorithm I'm trying to use. Uh, it's a neural network that was pre-trained pre to imitate this algorithm. So in, in this case, this is a GNN that was pre-trained to limit its value iteration, and it will, it will give me updated value iteration estimates. Okay, why exactly can I do this? What, what gives me some, some power to do this? Well, basically value iteration is a dynamic programming algorithm, and thanks to some, some algorithmic, some uh, results before uh, from, from the paper that was already mentioned and will appear one, one more time, uh, in more depth uh, in the next part. Uh, basically, we can learn, GNNs are, are well suited to learn uh, value, to learn dynamic programming algorithms and value iteration as being one of them. And we can pre-train the graph neural network to perform value iteration style computation. Maybe I'll try to convince you a bit more. So if I look at the computation of value iteration, uh, you can think of my states as my nodes and my actions as my edges. Um, this is basically like I, I'll hold in each node, I'll hold my current belief of my value and I'll hold things like the reward. Um, and on edge, I'll, I'll keep like the prob probability be of going between two nodes with that action type. Uh, and I can also think, keep things like the discount. So basically now you can see that the updating the value using estimates from the neighboring nodes looks very similar to the updating message passing. Uh, neural network. So basically, I look at my previous estimate. Um, so I look at my uh, well at my current uh, node embedding, which includes something about the reward, and I look at the message. Well, this message in reality is everything that I gather from my neighboring nodes, um, which aligns like in the sense of I'm doing this sum over neighboring nodes the same way I could do it in the when computing messages, and I'm looking at the basically the, the states that are nearby, which are the nodes that are linked, and the, the information on the edge between every pair of nodes. Okay, to summarize what I, what I just said, hopefully I convinced you that these computations are quite aligned. Basically, what this looks like is for each action, 
I have my graph uh, where each vertex represents a state. In the node, I will keep the following. I will keep the value uh, information my, at my current time step, so my value estimated at time t. Um, and I have my reward. Uh, and then in the edge, I'll keep the probability of going, so basically the probability between two on the on between two nodes uh, using this action. And I'll keep gamma, which appears everywhere, but we found it useful to put it on the edge. And the idea is that, okay, these are my inputs. Now I'll I'll, pre I'll train this graph neural network on top of, on, on this graph input to simulate the value iteration. What this means is that I'll give the, the value iteration estimates at time t, and the GNN needs to give me the estimates at time t plus one. And I'll, I'll train the GNN in this teacher forcing way, and I'll evaluate on strong generalization. And I, I did some work before, so, and I, so I can tell you already this works. Um, but let, let's see, like, maybe I can convince you even more by showing you that this works. OK, well, the PPO still hasn't done much, anything interesting. So um, yeah, we still need this, all these other um, considerants. OK, so I'll, I'll go on to pre-training a neural algorithmic executor on the value iteration algorithm. And the more interesting part is like, how do I, how do I build this synthetic data? Uh, so that's one side. And then what's the, the model I'm applying on top of this? OK, so basically the synthetic data, the graph can look any like any way I, I want it. I have two, two variants here, like a deterministic uh, MDP. So just the, the uh, probability going between two, uh, two states when there, when there is an action taking them, it will be one. Uh, and they also did something like a card pole graph, which is like which is a, a binary search tree. Basically, if I if I go too much left or too much right, uh, th 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 those are basically the two the two children I can like the two actions I can take. Okay, so how do I generate the NDP? Well, the the graph will give me the the probability, and the, so this is the the information that I keep on the edge, and this is the information I keep on the nodes. Um, and then I, I'll decide on the discount. In this case, we, we did 0 0.9, which is quite common uh, for a lot of these environments. And then, so this is my input data. Uh, my output, so by basically the, what I'm trying to predict, my ground truth will come from running value iteration on top of this, uh, on top of this MDP. So I feed in the MDP that I, that I constructed and I'll run value iteration, which will give me something of, uh, like where one axis will be the, the number of time steps before value iteration converges. So each of these time steps will serve as one signal for the GNN. Um, okay, let's, let's have this, let's run this. So I, I show you how to build the data. Here I'm just doing a data loader. So basically I'm building, I have my, my, my MDP, uh, so this is all synthetic data, right? I can do everything I want with it. Um, and these are my ground, my, the ground truth. So that's basically what I'm trying to learn to predict. I also have some, some sparsification because I, I like to keep, so basically my, my information will be in the, in, the, in the context of senders, receivers, and edge features. Okay, so now that you know how my data looks like, so I have my X, Y, where my X is the MDP, my Y is what I'm, what the value iteration is giving, and that's what I'm trying to predict. Uh, I'll do a normal message passing. So basically, let's go from, from this part. I'll do some, some encoding of the node information and of, of the age uh, information, and then I'll do some processing. So basically, I'll use, I'll use a message passing layer uh, to update the information um, on each node. And then I'll decode. So basically, this is the part where I'm trying to predict values, and that's what I'll compare with the what the value iteration uh, gave. Okay. So to to go a bit more into the message passing part, um, let's see. Yes. Okay. I still have some time. So I'm computing the messages. Uh, you can see, like I'm I'm using the oh, I'm using the senders, the receivers to to compute messages, and then I'll aggregate them. Um, I can tell you from experience, the sum was the, be the better aggregate in this case. Okay, um, so I'll just 
basically next they'll just pre-train this GNN. So this is quite standard supervised learning in a way. Um, so I'm doing, I'm using my model and I'm, I'm trying to predict what value iteration would give me. Um, and let's see what it does. Okay, this, this will train for a bit. So basically this, I, will, I have some samples and I'm looking what is the last step loss. So basically how good are the estimates of the GNN from what the value iteration gave me, which I know converges to something that's, that's probably optimal uh, or very, very, very close to optimal because I have to stop at some point. So I put some threshold to, to keep it feasible. Okay, so this, this information is quite small. So I can see I start like with something, um, but on average, like basically aggregating overall time steps, it does not doing that well, but I see this actually decreases very quickly. Um, and it's thanks to the good, like the, the good alignment between the algorithm I'm trying to learn and the GNN I'm using. Uh, and this will keep training. Um, I think at some point it will tell us how well it is at actually predicting the policies based on the values it, it learned. So if the, if the ordering of the values uh, coincides with the ordering given by the algorithm, I will just let it think for a bit. Uh, this is all on CPU, so you can, you can do all of this stuff on CPU, um, but let's do some, some recap in the meantime. So what have I done, basically? I have my, my frame. I have some encoder. So this frame goes into, into latent space. I have a high dimensional encoding of the frame. Then I learned the transition model, which I use uh, in a breadth first search manner. Uh, to expand the local MDP, to imagine what my neighbors and my neighbors' neighbors and my neighbors' neighbors' neighbors would look like. This graph, I, I use a GNN to, to basically update the, 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 the representation of the state. This GNN was pre-trained to do value iteration. So now I know that this state, its representation would be better indicative of the values in the state. Using this, I can then use... I can then use the representation to predict policies and to predict values. Um, so the, yeah, this is the, the GNN population. I can use the, the, the state to predict policies and the values and then do the, the whole area loop. So basically gather some trajectories, look at how, what they predicted and try to learn from it. Okay, so this actually trained for quite little time. Like this was, I guess on the order of a few minutes, a couple of minutes, and it's already quite good. It has accuracy 84. Um, and this was like not without any particular tweaks. So I know the GNN is quite good at learning uh, the policies on some random MDP I gave it. So I, I could also show you a bit more about what this means. So like I pre-trained my GNN. Uh, to use this GNN, well, I have my encoder. Like basically I, I showed you the baseline before I show you what, what the Excelvin agent. So the one with the GNN looks like. So I have my, my encoder. Uh, which again encodes my state. Uh, I, this is the part where, okay, so I'm learning a transition model. That's the, the one I kept mentioning. So basically I have as inputs a state and an action. And what I'll try to predict is what the next state would look like. The way I'm training this is by contrasting. So I am looking, I have like a positive loss and a negative loss. Basically the positive is I am trying to say, uh, is my prediction from my transition model of the starting from this state and the action, is my prediction close to my next state? So if I predict it correctly, then this loss should, should, go, should be small. And then this prediction should also be further away from, from states that are not the true next state. So this is the part of the negative loss. Okay, so hopefully, I can give you like a one sentence summary. The transition model should learn to encode my to, to encode my next state closer to the true next state than some random state that I can choose from my batch. And this is why I'm permuting here. I, this, I, this is how I'm getting my negative samples. Okay, so you sort of see like what the encoder looks like, what the transition model looks like. Um, I can show you what the new policy looks like. So Let's look at like what the policy, like what the what the Excelvin policy would look like for for when it decides what to act, how to act. So this is what the baseline did. I just had my encoder, um, and then I had I, I input my observation and I get my latent. Okay, this is the part I added for the Excelvin part. So now I have a GNN that I'll 
I'll run on a graph I'm creating. So the graph I'm creating is, uh, is using the transition model uh, and it basically takes uh, for some number of steps. So basically one hop away or two hops away. That's how I'm specifying how big this tree should be. I'm slowly building this tree and then I, I will run the, the graph. Let me show you on top of this tree. So basically after running the GNN on top of this tree, now I have updated representations uh, of, my, of my state. Um, and then based on this updated representation, which is more indicative of the value than I was before doing this, I can predict the policy and the value and anything else I need to compute to learn better from my data. Um, so this is also what, what the baseline did. This is what the baseline did. This whole part with using a GNN to learn a better representation this indicative of the value is what we added in the in the agent. Everything else stayed the same. Okay, um, so let's let's run this, and I can basically I can I can explain like I, we can see exactly like I explained, but we can we can see exactly what building the tree looks like. I have I have my root node uh, which should be here. So I start like. Basically, my tree just consists of my root node. Um, and then I will take all actions. So I have all actions somewhere here. And then using all actions, I will apply this transition model um, to obtain what the next children should be like. Like what the what the one hop away states are are like uh, based on this transition model that I am training. And basically I'm I'm adding to the senders and the receivers. And I'm slowly building this tree for the number of hops I'm decide, I decided up front. Um, we tried like this, this depends on the environment, but um, yeah, some environments will require more hops. So this means they require more planning, imagining like longer trajectories before deciding how to act. Okay, so we build the, we build the, the tree and this is like, this is how we build the graph. Okay, so putting it all together, we basically have the, now our encoder also has like the, basically the frame will go into the encoder, but it will also be used for the transition model to learn what the true next stage should look like and what it shouldn't look like. Then the XLVM policy, which has like the encoder, but also builds this local MDP and does a GNN on top of that to learn better representations. Um, and then I'll do what I did before. I basically have my my heads on top of that, and I'll compute some some policy, some values, and I learn from these estimates and try to get better. Okay, so let's look. You can I'll share this afterwards. You can play with with it like in in different environments. But let's look how how this performs. Um, so the Monte Car, which is what I was showing you, the PPO got minus two hundred. As we as we saw when trying to run it, the baseline. So basically, it didn't learn to get up up the hill. But then with with this added uh, graph on top and the GNN part that updates my representation, I I can start getting up the hill. And this is from very few trajectories, like just a hundred hundred trajectories. And these are some other environments that also we run in like very low data environments, um, very low data setups. And we see, like again, the using this component uh, does better than, than not using it. Okay, uh, we also looked at some more complicated environments uh, with like uh, more complicated, in a way, observations. Uh, mostly like Atari games such as Freeway, Alien, Enduro, and Hero. And we generally see that the the Excelvin agent uh, does does better than than the the one that literally runs value iteration on top of a predictions, scalar predictions, and better than the baseline. In a, in a few cases, like we see that it does better, like considerably better, especially in the first part of training, like let's say in the first half. So basically in the lower data environment, in the lower data scenarios, but then towards the end, the, the baseline or the HEC catch up, um, which makes sense, right? Like this, uh, basically HEC sort of does the same as the, as the Excelvin agent, but it learns the algorithm instead of learn, uh, using a neural algorithmic reasoner. So if the if the scalars that are predicted to run the algorithm on are getting better, then the algorithm will start being more and more useful. So the HVC agent will start being more and more useful. Okay, so why did it work? I think that's the, the part that I found uh, 
um, like more and more and more interesting over the time. Um, and let's look a bit at like what this means to to use the neural algorithmic reasoner in a in an agent. And I think this would this could give us some some good food for thought for for future steps. Okay, so if you remember, our executor network was pre-trained and frozen. Um, so what this means is I have my GNN, I pre-trained it on the synthetic MDPs, I can build how many I want, um, I can make them like more or less aligned to the environment, or I can just make them random, we saw that this is like quite robust to that. Um, and the encoder needs to learn the idea of that the executor will be useful if the what it gets in as input is already has some has some space for for values basically for value prediction so the encoder needs to learn to map the inputs into the executor's latent space uh, which is analogous to how humans try to map real world into algorithmic inputs so but now instead of doing it manually you have like a neural network to take care of it so the idea is that the, this encoder over which we're running a value iteration style computation needs to have some some idea of a value estimate so what we'll do is we'll look at the embeddings uh, before and after running the uh, gnn layer um, so and we want to see how predictive they are of the actual values from running value iteration and we did this on grid uh, grid uh, mazes uh, on which we can compute all of this stuff okay so basically we evaluate linear decodability by linear regression and we can see like the green one is the one just from the encoder and the, the red one is the one after running the GNN. So after having updating, updated our estimates using a value iteration like computation in latent space. So we see that the input values are already quite predictive, which is useful and quite necessary because doing, doing it on some something that wasn't any at all predictive would probably not have updated too much. Uh, and then the executor cons consistently refines them. So basically, while we have good pre good predictions before, we're basically almost close to perfect uh, after doing the GNN update. So our encoder learned to correctly map the input to the latent algorithm, and our executor makes this iterate like this estimate even better. Okay. Um, the other part that I found quite interesting um, is well, did we say running the algorithm has this uh, algorithm uh, like the ground truth algorithm such as such as how they do it in h3c or gqm where they run value iteration on the on the predicted scalars uh, that has a bottleneck so basically has the bottleneck of having to predict the scalars and running the algorithm on top of that um, and what this means what what we're saying by this is that in inaccuracies in scalar inputs to value iteration will affect performance um, and the idea is that they will affect performance more than if we had the same per perturbations in high dimensional state embeddings. Um, and this is like basically this is sort of what we see in practice too. The algorithmic reasoner sacrifices perfect accuracy to achieve robustness. So basically what we did is we have uh, we have our like our scalars that we where we 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 feed into the algorithm. This algorithm would either be the ground truth algorithm or a latent algorithm. Um, and in these scalars, we'll put some noise. So basically, this we are trying to imitate if the if the scalars came from a neural network and this neural network didn't predict perfectly. So we're putting in noise into the value iteration inputs, and we're putting in noise in the executor embeddings. And then we run the update, the whether it is in scalar mode or latent mode, and we see that at zero noise, the Excel min is not optimal. Um, but we see that the value iteration degrades much faster. And while the algorithm might give a perfect solution, it, it does it in not in where, where we want it to, to do it. So basically it gives a perfect solution, but the, for not the actual input we cared about. Okay, I hope I convinced you on why this is, this is useful, but to, to draw some conclusions, um, some, well, first some Excel means specific conclusions. Um, well, what we, what we looked at now, like over the last 50 minutes or so, we looked at how to formulate optimal plans in a reinforcement learning setting. Uh, we know that value iteration is useful for this, but this requires full knowledge of the underlying MDP. Um, there is this previous work value iteration nets that already 
sort of like uses uh, the, the assumption of the full knowledge of the MDP, having it fixed and known. And they do, they use the leverage, the idea that convolution is similar to value, to value iteration. And so they use convolution neural networks to imitate value iteration without actually forcing it to do that. Uh, and the, the alternative is also to apply the algorithm. So for value prediction nets, uh, the H3C trickwin, as I was referring it to, to it earlier, we can predict scalars and we can run the, the algorithm on, on top of that. Uh, but this has the bottleneck effect I was mentioning. So the bottleneck implies more data is needed before the agent can become like proficient or more, more performant. Uh, and that's what we saw, like the H3C took a while to catch up to the XLVIN. And the very point of the, the of planning is data efficiency. So we really wanted to, to set to break this, bot this bottleneck. And we did this by pre-training the GNN on value iteration uh, using this neural algorithmic reasoning paradigm. And then we freeze it and we put it into agents. So basically we see empirical gains in both classic control and Atari. And we see that consistently HRC requires more time to catch up. So better better predictions for the in the scalars for it to become more useful. And why does it work? We looked at the studies. I think that those are quite interesting. And we see that they demonstrate both the algorithmic bottleneck and the alignment of value iteration. And then some more deploying uh, neural algorithmic reasoning conclusions. So like a bit more general. Uh, there's a lot of real world solutions that could benefit from combining classical algorithms with neural networks. Um, I was mentioning short as path early, or value iteration as I, as I showed. Um, and generally graph neural networks are well suited to, to imitate dynamic programming algorithms. So we could start from there, I guess. And we, we did some more work on this. So precisely on extending this idea of value iteration as a, as a neural algorithmic reasoner, we moved on to continuous action spaces and it becomes interesting because it, it's less trivial to, to build these trees because now we need to figure, think about uh, sampling and to, to think about uh, what happens when the MDP we built does not fully align with the, um, like the local MDP we built is not the true MDP, uh, which is something the value iteration uh, assumes. It assumes it can always see all neighbors, but in this case, we can't do that. Uh, and hey, we will present this uh, on Monday, I think, um, at uh, in the poster session. Um, and there is also like moving away from value iteration, we can think of some other, and moving also moving away from reinforcement learning, we can think of like some other cases where we sort of know what's going on, so we know the underlying algorithm. Um, so this the, the second part of the on the on the right, it's from reasoning modulated representations where they use it for for self-supervised learning, basically we have like some collisions, we know how, like we know the laws of collisions. So we know how to update uh, our latency in a more informed way. Um, and apart from thinking of like specific algorithm, like one algorithm that we could use and put into our, our models, uh, we could, there are probably in most cases, there are multiple algorithms which we care about. Um, or in some case, so this is what the how to transfer algorithmic reasoning uh, knowledge to learn new algorithm has looked at, like how to do a, like two algorithms and two algorithms when we don't have all the all the information. And like the, the very recent uh, presented just yesterday as an oral when looking at all the algorithms in the CLRS uh, benchmark. Um, and I will I will hand on to Andrew now, which I think uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk into the the, the another side of uh, taking further steps in this uh, in this direction, which is deepening uh, uh, neural algorithmic reasoning. Um, thank you so much. This is going to be a little bit different. This is on deepening neural algorithmic reasoning, and this is sort of everything we know about aligning networks and algorithms, um, particularly dynamical programming algorithms and graph neural networks. So uh, for starters, I'm gonna talk about what the word alignment sort of uh, has been understood as meaning uh, in the last couple of years. And I'm gonna talk about um, for in particular looking at dynamical programming, what is a convolution? Why does it show up so often? And then I'm going to talk about the paradigm of uh, these diagrams called polynomials and integral transforms as a sort of formalism for this. And then I'm going to show you some code to try to convince you that uh, unlike a lot of 
uh, neural network theory. This lines up extremely well with the code that is written in the network. Uh, and then uh, depending on time, I will uh, proceed on to say a little bit about monads. So if that scares you, then just interrupt with lots of questions as we go and maybe it will get it will get pushed off. But um, uh, for for starters, so what is alignment? And uh, a lot of what has been said about alignment lately has been in relation to this paper, what can neural networks reason about? And the idea is that a network will do better on a task if the network and the task somehow share a structure. So reasoning task here kind of means that you have a reasoning function that you're trying to approximate. And uh, in particular, uh, this means that graph neural networks and dynamical programming are a kind of strong match, which is also something that they uh, develop in this paper. So uh, don't worry about processing this whole thing, but this is basically their definition of alignment. And it basically says, you know, if you decompose what your network is doing into modules, and then you have the same decomposition for some kind of a reasoning function, and the modules in your network can learn the modules in the algorithm, then the two are aligned. Uh, and this has been a really influential idea. Two and a half years, 165 citations, like lots of people have picked up on this and started using it as um, kind of terminology to talk about, oh, look, I've made a network that's aligned to this. I've, you know, um, if, if we, you know, we can do better on this task or that task on the basis of alignment. Uh, and I'd like to sort of explore this a little deeper because a lot of the uh, discussion of alignment, it's often, at least to me, not exactly clear what precisely is the thing being aligned. And there's a little bit of guesswork where you have to say, okay, they look really aligned, they look pretty aligned. Uh, and, you know, in general, there's a lot of open questions uh, that come out of thinking about this. So even though they, uh, this, this paper really addresses this connection between dynamical programming and graph neural networks, uh, the definition of dynamical programming here doesn't actually cover a, a lot of dynamical programming. It really covers sort of uh, uh, certain, certain sort of recursive things like, like Bellman Ford, but um, so it, it may be that there's a more sort of general thing to talk about. And then there's also, even in the simple cases, there's kind of a few parts. So some questions are, you know, how exactly can we align to make sure that our dynamical programming update rule matches something that our network is doing? Um, what if in alignment we uh, want to do sparse updates? So that is to say, what if you know, we don't want to update everything all at once. What if we have, uh, what if our algorithm contains things from, uh, you know, higher level programming languages like pro like uh, pointers? Uh, and is it even possible for a network to align to more than one algorithm? That's a, a sort of interesting thought. So, uh, and I just wanted to point here to these two equations. So the first one is sort of a general formula for mass message passing in a um, graph neural network. And the second is the Bellman Ford algorithm. And you can clearly see that there is a, a tremendous amount of structural similarity between the two. But you can also see that there's at least three parts that, that need to align up because uh, this big O plus on the top, this aggregation of the message functions, this has to sort of align with a minimum in the lower equation. Uh, and then you have this uh, psi, uh, the, um, yeah, the, um, the message function itself that has to align with this plus, and then you have this phi. So uh, there's sort of at least three things that need to align even in this single step uh, of a simple dynamic programming algorithm. 
And to try to explain these three steps, um, Petar and I wrote this odd paper, which uh, tries to really uh, dig into this structure a bit and define it in a way that, so for example, uh, that you could use to prove uh, more rigorous connections between things, because that's sort of an important step is like, if you can't quite define the thing that you're talking about, then it's it becomes very hard to have any proofs uh, in your discussion. Now, um, what I'm going to describe this uh, by no means describes everything that there is to describe about dynamical programming, uh, but it covers quite a lot and it has led to uh, improvements that have uh, well, not necessarily stood the test of time, but you know, lasted six months or so and showed up in in the generalist paper. So that's, you know, sort of like a test of time uh, in in machine learning. So uh, to just jump right in, I want to first say this is a question that I thought about quite a lot doing this work. What is a convolution? Uh, and it was surprisingly hard to find a good definition of a convolution because, Everybody that deals with convolutions deals with particular kinds of convolutions and not others. So for example, a standard kind of discrete convolution would be something like this, and that's a convolution. But then you know, you also have sort of convolutions that show up as integrals. And obviously these are related, but they're both sort of uh, examples of convolutions. But then you have these other things that are also kind of obviously convolutions, but Generally, rather than being called convolutions, they're called transforms. Uh, so I, I like the Fourier transform, the Laplace transform, the binomial transform, the, I forget, one of these I forget, but oh yeah, the discrete Fourier transform. Uh, so like what do convolutions have in common? What is the underlying structure of convolutions that, that we can use to kind of pinpoint what they are mathematically, and it should be some structure that uh, is flexible, but in, in some ways also rigid. It has to be a, a sort of, we, we can't be vague about it. We need to really nail this down. Uh, and this brings me to uh, the sort of central concept in our paper, which is integral transforms. Uh, so what's the idea? The idea is suppose we have, uh, and please ask questions if you have any about this part, because I think this is the sort of key idea. Now we've got uh, sort of data that live on the circle and on the line, by which I mean that our input is a function, which it doesn't matter what values it takes, but if you want to, you can think of it taking real numbers as values. Uh, so our input sub a, this is a function of x, where x is a point on the circle. So it's a function f of x. And input sub b is then a function on the line. So it's some g of y, where y is a point on the line. And we know we want to combine these two pieces of data in some way in order to produce an output that lives on the line. This is just, you know, uh, just for example, right? So we've got line data and we want to somehow modulate it by circle data. So how does this work? So like there's, I mean, there's obviously really obvious, you know, there's obvious ways to do this, like throw away all the circle data. Well, that's pretty unsatisfying, right? We want to really mix the two up somehow. And we do this using an object known as the cylinder that really does have properties of both things. And basically, if we have some function on the cylinder, so the cylinder is the circle times the line, so we can think of the function living on the cylinder as a message function of x and y. And uh, basically, we can just integrate over the circle to get now data on the line. So we. We are integrating now the message function of x and y uh, dx, right? x is the circle. Uh, so so that's, that seems like a sensible thing to do. And this certainly looks like um, a lot of transforms. But now, how do we actually get a message on the cylinder? Uh, we 
we basically, we need to produce it by combining messages on two different cylinders. Okay, so, so we need, uh, uh, I mean, and we can do something quite simple and just multiply the two. And the reason uh, we want two cylinders is we want to be able to broadcast the signal we have on the circle up to the cylinder, the first cylinder. And we want to be able to broadcast the signal we have on the line up to the second cylinder. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, this is sort of a simple transform that gets you from W to Z, but uh, you know, functions that live on W to functions that live on Z. And there's a note here, uh, every single time we have ever presented this, there has been a question, isn't one of the arrows going the wrong way? And the answer is no, uh, because the, you can see that X maps to W and it maps because the cylinder collapses down to a circle. The second cylinder collapses down to a line. There's no natural way to, to map it back up. And this is analogous. I mean, so then how is it that this thing we call the pullback, how is it that it goes the other way? Well, basically think hard about how a tile operation works in you know, um, TensorFlow or, or JAX or whatever, uh, which is that you, know, you have a map say from a grid down to a line and then, but, but the tile doesn't, the tile goes the other way. Right, that you tile a, a tensor, a one-dimensional tensor, up to a two-dimensional tensor. So, so that's the kind of tricky bit. And the point is that this first part, uh, this first arrow, the pullback, this is where we make copies of our data. We make all the copies we're going to need, uh, and then, uh, and then we plug those copies in as arguments to a message function. Uh, and then we aggregate all of those message functions to produce our output. So that's the that's the basic idea. Now let me go into the the sort of slightly more formalized version of it. So so I I, I still don't know the sort of most intuitive term for diagrams like this, but they're sometimes called polynomials. Um, we call them polynomial spans in the paper. But the, the intuition here is that if you're doing this, if you're doing this transform, it's very similar to, in fact, in some ways identical to evaluating a polynomial. How do you evaluate a polynomial? Well, first you, you figure out what your variables are, and then you figure out how many copies you're gonna need of each variable. And then you plug them into their positions and then you do all of the multiplications and then you do all of the additions. So those are the three steps, variable substitution, multiplication and addition. Uh, so, so we have such a diagram uh, and here I'm assuming that these sets are finite uh, because our sort of key example is tensor shapes. Uh, though, as I illustrated, it's not really the only thing. You can apply this to infinite things, but maybe it's not as relevant to thinking about network architectures. Okay, so the question is, given such a diagram, how do we actually interpret it as a transform? Well, what are we transforming? We're transforming uh, sort of, say, functions from W to R, and here R like I said, you can think of it as the real numbers, but in any case, it needs to be some set that has a multiplication and an addition, uh, which is a structure known as a semi-ring. And so again, if you think of W, X, Y, and Z as tensor shapes, then maps from W to R are tensors of that shape, right? And we represent those functions with brackets and uh, we describe, I won't go into tremendous detail, but if you want all the, the, the details, they're in our paper. Uh, we describe uh, the transform that sort of 
is implied by this diagram. In other words, when you have this diagram of finite sets, you already have an implied transform, which roughly consists of a tiling operation followed by some kind of a multiplication uh, in neural nets. This may also look like a concat. Uh, and then followed by some kind of aggregation or plus. And the basic idea here is that you produce a message by combining in an ordered fashion the, the list of arguments to the message function. Uh, and then you produce the output by aggregating uh, a bunch of messages. And what this diagram is supposed to convey is that you really have a list of arguments coming in to um, the message function. But then coming into the aggregation, you have a bag, which is like a list, but uh, without an ordering. Uh, and of course, this is part of how graphs are formalized is, you know, you have some neighbors, but a priori, you don't think of your neighbors as being ordered. They may have some labels that are ordered or some data that you can order, but sort of the um, the edges themselves aren't ordered in the usual way we think of graphs. Uh, so the point is that having access to this thing, now we can say, well, for plugging in R equals equal to the real numbers with the usual addition and multiplication, then you get an honest description of um, convolution in neural networks, including message passing and GNNs, uh, at least uh, ignoring some embeddings and nonlinearities, but you get the basic structure. Uh, but then if you plug in sort of interesting values of R, like the, the tropical numbers, they're called the tropical numbers because uh, tropical geometry was invented in Brazil. Um, and the, the point is that this is a structure where you have your addition, you, what you think of as your addition is really the min operation. And what you think of as your product is really the plus operation. These are sort of like a, a, a logarithmic degeneration of the reals. Um, and it turns out that many, 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 many classical algorithms sort of operate naturally in that setting. Um, Bellman Ford is a good example. We can sort of pop back to this equation. So this equation on the bottom really is taking place in the tropicals in the sense that it's a polynomial, but where times means plus and where plus means min. Um, so this, uh, this semi ring, it, it's, it's quite ubiquitous and uh, seems to explain why max aggregation has been so potent, as well as the fact that you can do sort of Boolean logic and some things like that more easily. Okay, so I guess I didn't have to go all the way back. We have the example here of Bellman Ford and Bellman Ford here is completely described, like 100% completely described by this one diagram where V is the set of vertices and E is the set of edges. Uh, we've slightly simplified the picture by assuming that every vertex has a self edge of weight zero. Uh, this is so nodes kind of remember their current value and don't write over it. Um, but if, you, if you're bothered by that, we do the, the messier version where you don't assume this. We do that in the paper, um, but there's more terms and so on. So, uh, just to sort of reiterate what this means in terms of a transform, you have your signal starting in the lower left, which consists of node features and edge features, in this case, edge weights. Yeah. 
uh, and then we broadcast these values uh, up to edges. The edge weights, you don't have to broadcast them, but the node, um, the node features you broadcast into a kind of um, sender position. And then you multiply, quote unquote, multiply, um, meaning add the two values um, going across the top. And you can, you can see that's so far, we're just describing exactly what happens in the equation at the bottom. Uh, and then finally, you take the minimum over all of the neighbors and this extra, this extra du term comes because we assumed the extra edge there. Uh, so that's it. This diagram is Bellman Ford in effect. And also you can describe message passing um, with similar diagrams. So um, one of the things that kind of led us to consider diagrams like this is uh, it's somehow very curious. Uh, all the, the, the sort of standard form for a GNN has these receiver dependent features, which I always thought was a little odd because, um, uh, you know, it, it's like you're receiving messages, but they're partially messages from yourself. Uh, but in any case, you can do this. You can do this perfectly fine with a polynomial diagram. It's just that you need um, to duplicate the node features so that one copy um, uh, is broadcast to the edges as sender features and one copy is broadcast to the edges as receiver features. Uh, and then they are combined and well, we this what I wrote down here doesn't quite explain the extra XU, although I guess same same point you you can probably get away with um, adding a self edge to to um, avoid that complication. Uh, but yeah, so this diagram perfectly captures this receiver dependent model of message passing that is sort of conveyed in this diagram. And uh, here, here we're assuming a fully connected graph. So E is equal to V squared. Uh, and the really miraculous thing here is that this diagram directly lines up with how the pseudocode looks. You can just see, you know, first of all, you take your, your node features and you tile them uh, in two different ways as the sender and as the receiver. Uh, and then you build your messages by plugging in to a message function. Uh, and then you aggregate um, over one of the variables. From that, I'd like to move on to uh, discussing some code examples. I, I was going to navigate GitHub for this, but it's probably cleaner to just have it have it um, have it screenshotted. But these are um, these are all snippets that are directly from the CLRS GitHub. Uh, so I I really tried to keep myself as honest as possible here with um, showing like what what lines up with the diagrams and 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 what doesn't, and you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, so, um, so we have this, um, this polynomial here. And the point is that I, I claim that this is exactly what the PGN processor does in CLRS. Um, and to just explain this arrow on the left, like I'm saying, you have graph features, which you can think of as functions from one to R. And then those are broadcast um, up to a grid. Uh, you have node features, functions from V to R, and those are broadcast up to two grids, uh, sender for one, receiver for the other. And you have edge features, which are uh, functions from V squared to R, uh, and those aren't broadcast at all. Uh, so you can see that these four things really are um, initialized here. Uh, the actual tiling happens inside of the next call, but I, you know, this is just, it, it 
the code does the same thing, right? Uh, so think of the expand dims as happening uh, in this blue arrow. Uh, and then in the green arrow, then, then all that's left for the green arrow to do is add them, right? Literally, it's just adding all four uh, arguments. And then finally, so th this is, um, for MPNN, this is aligned. For PGN, there's, there's a, a, a little... Uh, detail to talk about here because there's a, a, a masking that goes on. Um, maybe, you know, exercise, work out how to resolve this problem. Like you, you have um, ba basically you've computed things that then get thrown away, which somehow isn't allowed by this diagram, but uh, you can pretend you didn't compute them or something like this. So, but you know, that said, with this detail of the masking uh, set aside, this is again uh, just the, the max aggregation, uh, which we said is highly aligned to um, lots and lots of DP algorithms. Uh, okay, now assuming that that's somewhat clear. Uh, one of the interesting things to come out of this paper uh, was um, triplet architectures. So the basic observation here is that uh, some algorithms like matrix chain order, uh, if you really look at what a node means in terms of the CLRS representation, you really need to see interactions between triples of nodes, not just pairs, in order to get the alignment just right. So that was sort of one place that this came out of, but I will discuss as well later another motivation, which is in terms of type checking, which is somehow producing edge level outputs. Um, actually, I can just pop over right here. So, so here is... Um, this diagram is an architecture that was very common. Uh, it, it seems to be the sort of standard way of augmenting a GNN with edge level outputs, which is you've got this V squared in the upper right. So you've got some tensor of shape V squared. You just copy it. You just copy it into the tensor V squared you need for the edge level output. Um, but that tensor, in a sense, is already being used to aggregate down to the V. And so there's sort of a type checking failure in this diagram because this red arrow on the right, it's not a function anymore. I said we were working with finite sets and functions. Well, this is not a function. Now, the fact that it's not a function doesn't mean you can't implement the network. You absolutely can. It's just that something about the formalism is telling us this is an illegal copy operation. You're supposed to make a copy earlier if you need a copy. And one way to think about this is that you're overloading the representation. This V squared representation, this sort of um, uh, edge hidden state, it really, uh, it now needs to do two completely different tasks. Um, it needs to sort of uh, know how to be aggregated into useful node messages or into useful node features. And it also needs to sort of already be useful edge features. And this is a kind of, uh, well, uh, it's a kind of worrying thing, a kind of failure of type checking, but it's also not terribly aligned to certain algorithms that need edge level outputs. So this was sort of the, the fix for generating edge level outputs. I, I've suppressed the V plus here for brevity, uh, but uh, the goal now is to produce something of shape V squared in, a, in sort of a way that's properly aligned to this kind of triplet view. And uh, what we then have to do is take our graph features and tile them up to V cubed, take our node features, tile them up to V cubed, but now there's three different ways to do it. Uh, and likewise for the edge features. 
Uh, and again, you can see that this is exactly what it really looks like in the code. You sort of initialize seven things. Uh, you, you do sort of seven different embeddings. And then you do the expansions and then you add them. Uh, and then you do a linear and, and just aggregate. So I hope that's uh, somewhat convincing. Uh, so move on to some of the, uh, I don't know, headier um, explanations here. Uh, this was the title of my PhD thesis. Um, I'm just kidding. That's not that's not true. It was the subtitle of my PhD thesis. Uh, but there's also a quote here that I, I uh, still kind of like, and uh, <clears throat> this is sort of a, a part of how I'm thinking about some of these things, which is we cannot understand what something is without grasping what under certain conditions it can become. So this is especially important, I think, when we um, think about neural networks, because the whole point is to make more neural networks. So understanding what your neural network is doing is somehow only interesting insofar as it suggests to you changes that you could make to your neural network. Uh, so, you know, somehow the question shouldn't be like, what is a convolution, but like, what else is a convolution? Or like, not what is message passing, but what, what could message passing be that it's not yet, you know? Um, and in any case, uh, some of these considerations have really, I've found myself thinking about monads a lot um, for thinking about them. And you might think, oh, I don't know what a monad is, but you do, you, you absolutely do, because you've used the list monad. In fact, you might have used it the first week that you knew how to code. Uh, I, I can't really think of any one thing in code that is more common than the list. Uh, but what is list? It's a type constructor. It takes a type and it returns a new type, which is the type of lists of the original type. And, uh, and just sort of the basic properties, I won't go into great detail here. Um, uh, though I gave a cats for AI talk a few weeks ago on, on monads. You can go and watch that if you want lots and lots more details. Uh, but the basic idea is that list here, I'm thinking of set as sort of types. This is the most basic way to think of types. It's just sets, the set of instances of the type. So the type int, that's the set of integers, right? And so on. So list is a way of taking types to types. And it comes equipped with two really nice things. One is that any element is automatically a one element list, right? In other words, we have a map for every X, we have a map from X to lists of X. Uh, and then furthermore, every list of lists is automatically a list uh, by concatenation. Uh, and these two facts together with some axioms for them that I won't go into, really uh, determine a lot of the usefulness of, um, of lists and, and how their sort of syntax and semantics behave. Uh, and and the, the one note I would make here is that everything that I just said is also true for bags, which are, you can alternately call multi-sets. Uh, so, uh, if you just in your mind here replace list with bag, uh, same same things are true for bags. A bag of bags is a bag. Uh, any element is a one element bag, etc. Uh, and we really thought about these um, list and bag monads to to kind of justify one of the claims that we made, namely that R R is somehow supposed to be a semi ring. Uh, well, this is this is sort of because R has to do two pieces of heavy lifting. One is that it needs to know how to convert 
the list of arguments to the message function into an actual message. And the other is that it needs to know how to convert the bag of incoming messages into a single output. Um, now, if you've worked at all with monads, say in Haskell, you, you know that things get pretty annoying when there's more than one of them. Uh, but you're saved if you can come up with something like this, which uh, is sometimes called a monad transformer, but I think of it as a distributive law. So it's a pretty simple fact about lists and bags, which is that if I have a list of bags, then I can unpack those bags into a bag of lists. Okay, so I have to think carefully about what this means. So I have bags B0 through Bn, and then I now, for every object in each bag, every possible way of selecting an object from each bag, I form that list. Uh, and then I put all those lists into a bag. Okay. Uh, so you may or may not have thought about this before, but it's actually equivalent to the distributive law for polynomial multiplication. So that's, that's a useful thing to go and think about. Uh, and long story short, we actually get semi-rings out of this. They're the algebras for the composite monad bag of list, uh, because it turns out bags somehow correspond to commutative monoids, which you heard about earlier today, or maybe they Maybe that was only here. Um, uh, and uh, lists correspond to general monoids. Uh, so somehow the two of them combined, right? You have some uh, operation, multiplication, that distributes over some other operation, commutative operation, addition. Uh, and, uh, and that gives you semi-rings. So, that's that's all I've got. Uh, sorry, was was there a question that? Yeah. Is it possible to implement such type checker for your? I don't know about implementing it. It's certainly possible to write a library that that sort of, uh, like I mean, we've thought a bit about writing a, a, a library that makes it harder to break these rules. Let me put it that way. Um, uh, and you know, I think Peter Peter knew somebody who who did um, a, a, a small version of this. Yeah, we said it as like a master's course mini project or something like that mm. for students to implement that. And there's a if you search, uh, there will be something like cat GNN on GitHub. Cat I can, GNN. I can mm. dig up. I can dig up the link. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the thing that surprised me was it just it looked really nice. Like it just it seemed it it seemed like I wanted to start yeah, I'll share writing it, code I, that way. Yeah, I found it. I'll um, share it. Uh, uh, I'll share it on the on the chat and the Slack. One thing I will note though is that CatGNN was built based on um, previous uh, version of our paper, so the basic spans, not the polynomial spans. So. There's yeah, it's a slight, there's going to be a slight specialization, mm. I think. Yeah, um, I mean, part of the, the long term hope for some of this is to have a way of talking about neural nets that allows people to do all of the things that they're already doing and want to do, but maybe makes things a little bit safer, it makes it a little bit hard to do, you know, sort of weird broken stuff. Uh, maybe that's too optimistic, but um, uh, you know, it's not. The goal isn't so much to prescribe a particular way of writing neural nets as to say, well, we, you know, we're sort of we're trying to write nets this way. Like <laughs> this is this is what we're doing. Hmm. I think I think now is the time to buy into category theory. I think it's cheap now, and it's it's going to go up.
Thank you all also for the very nice words uh, about our tutorial. If you have any feedback on it or anything you would have wanted to see and we did not include, please let us know, uh, Slack, mm -hmm. Zoom, or otherwise. Yeah. And maybe I'll mention that uh, we plan to keep developing the algorithmic reasoning uh, tutorial web page. Uh, so uh, I'll share it one more time on the on the main Slack. Uh, as well as on the on the Zoom chat, so uh, we're we're going to gradually add all the materials we have for the tutorial today, the slides, the references, code pointers, collabs, and stuff. So watch the space. Maybe one day we can grow it into a bit of a nice resource for this uh, emerging emerging area. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of talks uh, before this. Yeah, thank you all for the very kind words you're writing so far. Thank you all.